One investment I hold that's received its fair share of both praise and criticism is the PIMCO Dynamic Income Fund, ticker PDI. I've noticed over the years that this closed-end fund has a way of dividing people, especially after the pandemic and when interest rates started to grow. Because there are some really good things about PDI, and there's also some concerning things about this investment. On one hand, it's currently offering a dividend yield of almost 13.5%, but on the other hand, its share price has gotten beaten up over the past five years. PDI has also never cut its dividend since its inception, but it also holds some very risky investments inside of it. PDI also offers a very good drip discount, meaning that when you choose to reinvest your dividends, you actually get a 5% discount on all your shares. But then according to PDI's undistributed net interest income report, which shows how well covered its dividend payments are, this fund has consistently been coming up short for a while. But it does pay a monthly dividend, which again has never been cut. Yet PDI comes with a very high expense ratio, even by closed-end fund standards. Despite these things, PDI has continued to maintain its monthly dividend, seemingly defying the odds at times. More recently, this fund's share price has been seeing a really good recovery. But again, on the negative side, it's currently trading for a big premium compared to its historic performance. So you can see a lot of great things and some concerning things going on with this closed-end fund right now. Despite everything though, I continue to hold this fund and I remain optimistic about its future. So in this video, we'll look at the most recent developments with PDI and I'll discuss why I hold this fund and where I think it'll eventually go in the future. Having launched in 2012, the PIMCO Dynamic Income Fund advertises itself as an investment that offers access to PIMCO's best income generating ideas across multiple global fixed income sectors. This multi-sector fund has always sought current income as the primary objective and capital appreciation as a secondary objective. The fund normally invests worldwide in a portfolio of debt obligations and other income-producing securities of any type and credit quality with varying maturities and related derivative instruments. The fund's investment universe includes mortgage-backed securities, investment-grade and high-yield corporates, developed and emerging markets corporate and sovereign bonds, and other income-producing securities and related derivative instruments. If we look at a breakdown of its holdings, we can see PDI holds some of the riskiest stuff you can find in a closed-end fund. The largest sector in their allocation breakdown are non-agency mortgages. These are mortgages that aren't backed by any government-sponsored enterprise like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. You can find some of these investments in mortgage REITs, although the vast majority of these companies hold agency MBSs as opposed to non-agency ones. PDI is also made up of 11.72% CMBSs, which are commercial mortgage-backed securities. These are fixed-income investments that are backed by mortgages on commercial properties rather than residential properties. This is another sector that's been experiencing challenges, but it ultimately depends on what kinds of commercial properties we're talking about. And then another large part of this CEF is made up of high-yield credit holdings. These are securities that hold non-investment-grade bonds, and as a result, they offer much higher interest. These are bonds that are usually rated in the lower Bs to upper Cs by the ratings agencies. So that would include these two categories on this chart. As you can imagine, there is a bigger risk of default on these, but on the plus side, these securities do hold tons of debt, which is good for diversification. There's other categories inside the CEF, but we just discussed roughly 60% of its investments. As I'll demonstrate, doing an in-depth analysis on everything inside PDI would be an extremely difficult task and probably impossible to know everything about all of its positions. If we go to the bottom of PDI's fund page, we can bring up a file called Holdings Report, which is an Excel sheet of everything inside this closed-end fund. This file's dated December 31st of 2023, which is what the fund was holding on this date. Alternatively, you can also use the Edgar database on the SEC's website by entering PDI into the company's search bar and then clicking on the latest form N-CSRS, which is a document that registered investment companies have to file within 10 days of disseminating annual and semi-annual reports to stockholders. In the last three months, there hasn't really been a lot of changes in terms of its holdings, so I'm going to pull up the spreadsheet on their website. The Excel file also has asset breakdown percentages, which I feel helps. Scanning through this file, you can see how massive of a burden it would be to actually do an in-depth analysis on everything in here. I started by doing some browsing, and there's a wide range of different stuff in here. For example, PDI holds a mortgage security for 245 Park Avenue. This is a 48-floor skyscraper in Manhattan that offers 1.7 million square feet of office space. It also holds a security that's comprised of debt issued by Naked Juice, which sells smoothies and is owned by Pepsi. Then there's also foreign currency contracts, Romanian government bonds, Sally May student loan securities, swaps, and the list goes on from here. Even if you were an expert on all these different types of investments, it would be hard to analyze them because a lot of these company bonds are issued by non-public companies that don't release their financial statements to the public. So you can see that doing a serious in-depth analysis on this thing would be extremely difficult. 
The majority of closed-end funds out there usually hold just one or a couple different asset classes, making them easier to look at. But with PDI, there's just so much going on here that it's not feasible. I really couldn't tell you how attractive Romanian bonds are right now. When it comes to really most of the PIMCO funds, unfortunately, a lot of people usually say that you just have to look at its past performance to see how the management team has been doing. And as someone who enjoys analyzing investments, I'm usually hesitant to just go along with an idea like that. So let's look at a couple more things to see if we can get a better understanding of the health of this fund. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, every PIMCO fund has a UNII report, which shows if the investments inside their funds are fully covering their current dividend distributions. The company publishes a new UNII report every quarter, and we can see as of February 1st, PDI only had a 65.78% fiscal year-to-date dividend coverage. As you can see, all the other PIMCO funds have also been underachieving, and yet to my knowledge, there haven't been any dividend cuts this year for any of their major funds. With that in mind, we should now turn our attention to another report, known as their Section 19 Notices. These are reports that are issued by some ETFs and closed-end funds that show where the source of their dividends are coming from. With CEFs, the three major sources of a fund's dividends are interest income, aka the investments they hold, capital gains, and return of capital. All of these percentages are just estimates, and we won't know the exact amounts for each category until the end of the year. But return of capital is what we're interested in, and I'll explain why in a moment. In January, PDI reported that 27.43% of their dividend was return of capital, which is pretty big. In February, their ROC had gone down to 22.8%, and then in March, PDI reported return of capital of roughly 18.63%, which again is another good improvement. What return of capital usually means is, if a closed-end fund can't fully cover its dividend that it pays, sometimes it'll actually take out some of the capital inside the fund to pay the shareholders. Too much of this is often a bad sign that a dividend cut is likely, because if a fund can't consistently cover their dividend and has to pay it using some of its assets, then this is going to shrink the value of the fund, resulting usually in share price declines. And yet there's another wrench to throw in this situation. As we've seen with some funds that use options, such as SPYI which I really like, return of capital isn't always the result of returning a part of the fund's capital to shareholders. Sometimes a company is allowed to classify some of its income earned from its investments as ROC, particularly income generated from option strategies. So although some funds like SPYI report having an extremely high amount of return of capital, this doesn't actually mean the fund is having to shrink itself to pay its dividends. So the real question here is, how much ROC is actually being generated from options and other investing strategies versus actual amounts being withdrawn from the fund? We simply don't know the answer to that, again making it harder to analyze a fund like this. But there's something else that I think is worth bringing up here. There exists another PIMCO fund that's actually been suffering much worse than PDI has, and yet for more than three decades since its launch, its dividend has remained mostly stable. The PCM fund, ticker PCM, is a really interesting investment that I think is worth comparing to PDI here. It holds a lot of the very same type of investments and historically has had worse dividend coverage. This fund's fiscal year-to-date dividend coverage is only 60%, and this has been an ongoing issue for it. Yet looking at PCM's dividend history, we can see this thing's never had a serious dividend cut. You can see it was paying 9.3 cents per share in the 90s, and then after all this time, it now pays 8 cents per share. This thing has really been like a zombie in that, somehow, after all these years of underperformance and less dividend coverage, its dividend has remained steady. Its share price has also remained mostly steady up until interest rates started to increase. Just like PDI, I expect PCM to also see a good recovery once interest rates get cut. So with all these things in mind, you can really see how hard it is to assess the safety of PDI's dividend. This company is just somehow able to maintain its dividend despite reporting numbers suggesting it could be in trouble. People for years have been trying to predict a dividend cut for this fund and it just hasn't happened. I do think it attests to just how well the people over at PIMCO are at providing a dependable dividend to income investors. I certainly don't have any regrets with my investment in this fund, and I still recommend it for people who are willing to accept the fact that it's largely a black box. It's probably not for the risk-averse investor, but I'm going to continue to hold my shares and reinvest despite it being at a sizable premium. The fixed assets inside will recover in share price once interest rates drop, so until then, I'm still convinced PDI will be able to hold on to its dividend at its current level. But with that being said, that's going to conclude today's video. If you'd like to connect and also see what's inside my own personal dividend portfolio, then feel free to check me out over on our Patreon, where you'll receive updates and be able to talk to me and other higher-yielding dividend and income investors. But with that being said, thank you all so much for watching today's video, and until next time, take care.